Number four, <clears throat> in order to help a congregation be fruitful, work to create, create a culture of reading and reflecting. Create a culture of reading and reflecting. You know, I've had a, a couple of interesting conversations since I've been here, one up in Brisbane and one down here in Sydney, with folks talking about, about what do you do when you're in a social setting where the people just don't read as much. Well, you know, one of the first churches I worked at up in New England, that was very much the case. You know, I began working with a sort of youth group and a young singles group where nobody ever read a book. I mean, it just wasn't what was done. Um, and what I found there is slowly but surely, I, it would affect the kind of books I would recommend, but I would just start reading books with people. And I found that as they did that, they would learn the benefit they could have by putting in that kind of effort. So I think you have something at stake. You have a way to bless your congregation if you can lead them to create a reading culture in your church. And you want to think, well, how can you do that? One way I try to do it is by giving away a lot of free books. So we have uh, the Sunday morning service, we have the Sunday evening service, and we have the Wednesday night Bible study. Now, not everybody comes to the Wednesday night Bible study. As I say, there are 50, 100, 150 maybe that come to that. That's still a lot of people. Sunday night is far more informal. On, it's, I'm, I'm dressed, for instance, like I'm dressed right now for Sunday night. Sunday mornings in our setting, I'll have a suit on. We want to be a kind of mainline Protestant church in camouflage. We want like a straying Methodist or Baptist or Presbyterian to be able to wander in and think nothing odd's going on here. And then as they sit through it all, they begin to realize, hmm, this is different. But we don't want to tip them off just by the way we're dressing. So we try to look what would be normal for that kind of church. Anyway, that's our contextualization. But so in that more formal service on Sunday mornings, I don't do this, but on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights, I always begin, I've been doing this for 15 years, by giving away a book or two books, or five books. So right after I finish the announcements, uh, when it gets to be time to move on and do other things, before I move on, at the end of the announcements, I'll say, look, I've got a book here by John Piper uh, on the lives of Augustine, Luther, and Calvin. Would anybody like a copy? They put up their hands. And they know that they have to read it. If I'm giving it to them, they're pledging they will read it. And so then I'll give them a copy. Okay, I've got two copies of Jim Packer, J.I. Packer's books here, God's Words. Great study of doctrine of scripture. Anybody want this? And I'll throw out a couple, of, a couple of copies of that. You do that over 15 years, it accomplishes a lot of things, you know? You teach them who good authors are. You know, you do that once, it may not matter. You do that a few times, ah, oh, well, you know. You do it for a year, well, they're certainly learning. You're going to be giving away a lot of co copies of books by Don Carson. You know, showing the spirit, here they are. The cross in Christian ministry. You know, how long, O oh Lord, the difficult doctrine of the love of God. But then you do that for 15 years, you know, and I think by God's grace, one of the things that I found is the congregation likes to read. There are hundreds of people in the congregation who like to read and they know good stuff. So often the, the kind of things people buy are just not very good. They're easy to eat mentally, but they don't leave a good taste in your stomach and they definitely do not build up your spiritual body. Well, that's not the kind of literature we want to give out. So by only giving out good whole grain stuff all the time, it may not initially taste as good, but it bears really good fruit. Kind of like the Hebrew boys in Daniel 1. You know, they eat the good food. They don't eat the stuff of the court. You don't notice the difference immediately, but over the weeks and months, you begin to notice the difference. That's what you can see in your congregation if you begin creatively trying to lead them in reading good books. One of the ways I've tried to do this also is by having what I call a theology breakfast. So every Thursday morning at 7 a.m. in my study for one hour, we have theology breakfast. I want to be clear, there is no physical food at theology breakfast. Do not be misled by the name. We are breaking our fast of theology, not of bacon or eggs, all right? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So we, we study, we, we get together, whoever wants to come, and every month I read a different theologian. So in the month of July, I was reading through sermons of Jonathan Edwards for anyone who wanted to come. And we would have time in that hour to read a complete sermon and have a few minutes for conversation. You don't have to do anything to prepare to come. I'll announce it at Wednesday night Bible study. <clears throat> you just turn up in my study. And I 
read, well, actually, I make everybody go around, give their name, and give some fact about the person that we're about to, uh, to study. So everybody gets, slowly gets educated uh, about this person through each other, sleepily giving, uh, he was American, or, you know, he was married, or, you know, but some people will throw in some, some meteor facts. And then we'll have most of the time just reading the sermon, and then there'll be a little bit of time for conversation about it. Well, so let me show you what I'm doing there. I'm underscoring, like to a, to a young Philip Van Steenberg, I am underscoring to him theologians that are, are worth his time to know. He knows that I have, I have highlighted C.H. Spurgeon for a reason. I've highlighted B.B. Warfield for a reason. I have highlighted John Bunyan and John Owen for a reason. He should give attention to these people. And that's what I do every year, just working through a different theologian every month. Practically for me as a pastor, I find it useful to keep a stack of books to give away. So if there's a book I know I'm going to use a lot, John Stott's Basic Christianity. I'll have a few of them laying around in my study. Uh, I have a books laying there that when I'm talking to somebody and, and I'm thinking, oh, I wish I had a copy of this to give them. Ah, guess what? Now I've got a copy of this to give them. And when I want to grab for one and it's empty, then I just tell Philip, which could you get me, you know, five more of these uh, so that they'll be filled up for next time I want to recommend that book. Because if you're anything like me, there are just a certain limited number of books you tend to recommend. You know, you don't recommend everything. And if it's a one-off recommendation, I'm not looking to keep copies of those anyway. I mean those books like Packer's Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God that I must have recommended a thousand times, literally, so far in my ministry. You know, so you're looking for books like that. They're going to be useful. Keep multiple copies of commonly recommended books around. And of course, some of you are wondering, well, 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 how do you pay for all this? Convince your congregation to give you a book allowance. Now, when you're a young minister, that book allowance may mainly be used to build your own library. And I still use that book allowance in part to build my library. My library is pretty built. I mean, I've got the reference works I need. I, I, I've got stuff like that. I'll, I still buy new books. Um, but I'm not, a, I'm not an acquisitions library. I'm not trying to get everything in that comes, and my shelf space is valuable at this point. So for me, increasing percentage of that book budget gets used all the time to try to buy books that I can give away to others. So you may find in ministry, as you get on in ministry, that you have a library that you're satisfied with, it's serving you well, but you could still use a book budget in order to try to help create this culture of reading and to understand God's Word more by the members of your congregation. Well, there's lots more I can say about that, but I want to move on. Number five.